Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone. And if you're a fan of our show, you'll know that one of our most popular features is our Gone But Not Forgotten series, featuring interviews with family members of some of the greatest and most beloved legendary stars of all time. Today, we're focusing on the fabulous Ava Gardner, an iconic actress who captivated the world not only with her breathtaking beauty, but by her earthy, magnetic screen presence in dozens of unforgettable classic movies, including Showboat, The Snows of Kilimanjaro, Mogambo, which earned her an Academy Award Best Actress nomination and a New York Film Critics Circle Award for Best Actress, The Barefoot Contessa, On the Beach, and Night of the Iguana, which earned her a Golden Globe Award Best Actress nomination and a Best Actress Award at the San Sebastian International Film Festival. She also received three BAFTA Award nominations throughout her career. And television fans certainly remember her recurring role as Ruth Galveston on Knott's Landing. Ava Gardner's hand and footprints are in the forecourt at Grauman's Chinese Theatre. She has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. There's a bronze statue of her overlooking the coast of Spain. And the American Film Institute placed her at number 25 on their list of the 100 greatest female screen legends of all time. Our guests are Ava Thompson, Miss Gardner's great niece and namesake, and her daughter, Ava Melissa. They manage Miss Gardner's intellectual property, and they are co trustees of the Ava Gardner Trust, continuing Miss Gardner's renowned legacy of generosity and compassion. On a personal level, their mission is to help the world see beyond Ava Gardner's legendary beauty, talent, iconic fashion style, and all the myths surrounding her famous marriages and personal life. Miss Gardner was much, much more than that. She was bold, courageous, independent, generous, and kind, and very much a trailblazer and a role model who was way ahead of her time. Our guests are coming to us today from the Ava Gardner Museum in Smithfield, North Carolina. Ava and Ava Melissa, welcome to our show and thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. And what a wonderful introduction to Ava Gardner. We really appreciate that. Well, she's one of my favorites. Ava, can you briefly explain to our viewers your family connection to Ava Gardner? Uh, yes. Ava was the youngest of all of the Gardner children, and my grandmother, Elsie May, was next to the oldest. There was 18 years difference between the two of them in age, so my dad and Ava were approximately the same age, and they grew up playing together, and they were best pals, and Ava was his self-appointed protector, and they remained uh, best pals throughout their lives. And it was because of that that I was just the right age for Aunt Ava to spoil me with uh, lots of attention and gifts from around the world and, and trips to visit with her. But she herself named me on a visit home to North Carolina in 1949, when my mother was expecting me, she asked my mom and dad to please, if I was a little girl, to name me Ava. And I have continued that by naming my daughter Ava, and my daughter has again continued that by naming her daughter, my granddaughter, Ava, also. Oh, that's beautiful. So just to clarify for our viewers, your grandmother, who was Ava Gardner's older sister, had a son, David, who yes. was Ava's nephew. But yes. because they were so close in age, they were more like siblings. And you are David's daughter. So you're the daughter of Ava Gardner's nephew, which makes you her great niece. And Ava Melissa is your daughter. Have I got that right? You have that exactly right, Bobby. <laughs> Now, Ava encouraged you as a young child to read books and to get a good education, correct? She did, yes. Ava explained to me when I was a teenager and my interest in school had waned somewhat. There were too many other distracting interests at that age to take my schoolwork very seriously. 
and uh, to get a good education because education was the key to living an independent, self-fulfilled life. And because it was coming from Aunt Ava and I looked up to her so much, I took that very seriously and got serious about my schoolwork once again. Uh, she was quite proud that I went on to get a four-year college degree. And then beyond that, I got a master's degree. But even though my master's degree was in school administration and I became a high school principal and also worked at the district level, she always saw me as a teacher because in her worldview, there was no higher profession than being a teacher. Now, Ava Melissa, you did meet Ava Gardner when you were very young, but I would imagine that you don't have any real memories of her, do you? The real memories that I have of her were not in-person memories. By the time I was old enough to create some real lasting memories, she was living in London and was unable to travel back and forth to to the United States very often. So we spoke on the phone quite often. (laughs) She would call and talk to me about, you know, my little six or seven year old goings on throughout the day. And she was very entertaining. And she just reminded me of a fairy godmother at that point, because, you know, I didn't have any real in-person memories of her, but Uh, I always got gifts from her and phone calls from her. So she just was almost a figment of my imagination, especially when I watched her movies and she was so glamorous and everything that I saw her. And she just reminded me of a fairy godmother. Ava, there's a story about a coloring book that moved me so much. I wonder if you would mind sharing that story with our viewers. I had uh, just received via post, a box of gifts from Ava. And one of the gifts was an Ava Gardner coloring book. And uh, a couple of three days later, my dad had a call from Ava. She had received a letter from a little girl in our area, uh, a little town west of Smithfield, And this little girl was terminal. She had a terminal illness and she had asked Ava for a coloring book. And Ava knew that she could not get one to her quickly. So she phoned my dad and asked my dad to put me on the phone and see if I would be willing to give my coloring book to this little girl and then she would replace mine. And of course I agreed. And my grandmother then picked up the coloring book and some other Ava Gardner items and delivered them to this little girl. And Harvey, this was so typical, Ava Gardner. She had the biggest heart and she was so compassionate. And I saw that firsthand many times. Well, it also says something about you as a little girl, because some kids would have said, I don't want to give my coloring book away. So (laughs) I'm very touched by that story because of her generosity and also yours. Now, a lot of people may not realize that Ava Gardner had a strong Southern accent and MGM had to hire a speech coach so she could lose the accent. But Ava and Ava Melissa, when you spoke with her, did she have an accent? No. I could pick up some of the Southern accent when she was at home and had been at home for several days. She would kind of revert back to her first speech patterns. But generally speaking, no. She kept her dialect fairly clean. She really did enjoy when she was making Night of the Iguana that John Houston had her to revert to her Southern accent. And she enjoyed that role for many reasons, but that was one of them. Ava Melissa and I have been teased uh, throughout the years that we sound like Ava Gardner before MGM cleaned up her speech. (laughs) Well, I think it's very charming. 
I read that Ava Gardner always denied that she had any acting ability. Is that true? Well, I don't think so. And it's not just because she's my relative. When, when I step back and look at her career uh, of about 60 performances in film and television over five decades, we see that her work survived the test of time. And when she first went to Hollywood as an 18-year-old, she was just as green as one could be. But through the years and with experience, she learned to be a great actress. And for me, that culminated uh, in the movie, or when I really recognized it was her role in the movie On the Beach. Oh, yes. I had been visiting with Ava and my Aunt Beatrice, her oldest sister in Los Angeles. And one afternoon on a leisurely dry day, I noticed her script on the coffee table. And I picked it up and I started going through it. And I saw that she had made, this was her working script, and she had made notes in the margins of things that she wanted to call back in portraying a particular scene. And in the very last scene, as the submarine was leaving, her note was to recall how she felt the very last time when she left her mother, knowing that her mother was dying and that she would never see her again. And for me, that was just so compelling and said to me that as an actress, she was very skilled and knew exactly what she was doing. Oh, absolutely. So is that your favorite movie of your great aunts on the beach? Oh, my goodness. It is so hard to pick a favorite. It is, I could pick maybe the top five, and that is certainly among the top five. But I also love Mogambo. Of course, I love the Barefoot Contessa. I love the Killers. And one that is often not mentioned very often, uh, 55 Days at Peking. She was just so beautiful in that movie. I guess that is one of the reasons it's in my top five, but Ava Melissa may have some different ones. I was just about to ask Ava <laughs> Melissa, do you have a favorite <laughs> Ava Gardner movie? Well, of course, when I was a young girl, I didn't get to sample all of her work because of the content, but I remember watching Showboat with my mother and we had uh, established a movie night and it was movie night again. And mama had, had decided it was time for me to see showboat. And when she walked on screen, it just felt surreal. She was just the most beautiful creature I had ever seen. And I didn't really even realize it was her until my mom pointed out that that's your Aunt Ava. And I just, I, I couldn't even I couldn't even grasp the concept that I had such a beautiful woman in my life and with such stage presence. And I thought she was wonderful in Showboat. She had worked mm -hmm. on that for such a long time. And one of her very good friends, Lena Horn, had given her some tips about, you know, how to sing and how to present herself. And it, I think it was a really special role for her in that time of her life. So I've become more attached to it the older I've gotten. And I would say that's definitely in my top three to five, but my mother and I definitely have the same taste in her movies on the beach is just a beautiful film and everything that she's in is pretty captivating, but you know, we're, we're a little, we're, <laughs> we're a little, it, attached to everything that she does anyway, so. <laughs> well, absolutely. Uh, my favorite movie of Ava's is The Barefoot Contessa because she was so fiercely independent in that film. Now, 
she really wanted to play the role of Mrs. Robinson in The Graduate, but the director, Mike Nichols, chose Anne Bancroft. I think Ava would have been the perfect Mrs. Robinson, don't you? <laughs> Yes, we definitely agree with that statement. I was so disappointed that uh, she wasn't in that in that movie when I didn't find out that piece of trivia until much later. But I mean, that was such a spectacular movie. And, you know, with Ava Gardner and I just couldn't imagine what what that would have done to her career at that point. But there it wasn't it, meant to be. <laughs> Now, as you know, Ava had three very famous husbands, Mickey Rooney, Artie Shaw, and Frank Sinatra. And she had close associations with Howard Hughes and Ernest Hemingway. And to some extent, those relationships sometimes overshadowed her public image and even her public identity, don't you think? I think it did. But what I would hope that modern young women recognize is, is that although Ava was totally committed in each one of those marriages and in those relationships, she was strong enough and independent enough when things didn't work out to be able to leave those toxic relationships behind. Uh, when her marriage to Frank Sinatra she recognized that it just was not going to work. Uh, she packed up and left the United States and established a residence in Spain. Uh, as a matter of fact, she said that she needed to get away from Frank and she needed to get away from the paparazzi. And she established her home in Spain. And for the next decade, she just had a great time. She loved the Spanish culture and the Spanish people, and there was room for so many adventures in Spain, especially among the, not sure if I'm going to pronounce this correctly or not, the Romani, the Gypsy, Spanish people. She loved their dress, uh, their traditional clothes. She loved their customs. She loved their strong bonds to family. And she loved the flamenco. <laughs> what do you think is the most misunderstood thing about Ava Gardner? Well, I think maybe she had somewhat of a reputation for being an international playgirl, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> and while she had a good time, she was a fun-loving person. No matter where she was or who she was with, she was a fun-loving person. She was had a much more serious side. She, she really was bold and courageous. I can't imagine packing up in my 30s and moving to a foreign country when I didn't even speak the language. That was a bold and courageous decision. It spoke to her independent spirit. It spoke to her adventurous nature and... I would really like for her fans and her friends throughout the world to recognize that she was so much more than her marriages. And by the way, you mentioned Howard Hughes. She never loved him enough to marry him, but he was a great friend and she would not say anything unkind about him. When she was asked about Howard Hughes, what she had to say was what a brilliant scientist he was, um, how he was so smart and accomplished so much. So she leaned in to complement his better traits. Well, uh, the things about Ava that I feel were misunderstood, I think resemble what you feel. She was very generous. She actively supported the March of Dimes, the Red Cross, the Cancer Society. She was a great humanitarian and she was a strong advocate for civil rights. And she was a lifetime member of the NAACP. And a lot of people really don't know that. 
And one of the things about Ava that I wasn't aware of until I did my research for this interview is the Ava Gardner Trust. Tell me why she created it and what you're doing with the trust now. The trust was fortunately made up by Ava when she was still with us. And uh, she had done, you know, you've touched on a lot of the charity work that she did when she was with us. But uh, one of the most special experiences for her was working with patients that had facial abnormalities after World War II. And uh, Dr. McEnroe had been working with these patients at the Queen Victoria Hospital. And she was a patient of his as well after she had developed a hematoma on her cheek, riding horses (laughs) and doing some tricks that she probably shouldn't have been doing on the horses. But Dr. McEnroe was a brilliant plastic surgeon and told her not to touch her face to let it heal naturally. But of course, this disrupted her self-esteem at the time. She was aging and she had a hematoma on her face and she didn't feel like she could be a public figure anymore. Dr. McEnroe and his wife were wonderful fans of hers before they met her. So this meeting was special for them as well. And Dr. McEnroe actually got her back into the spotlight and gave her back some of her self-esteem by having her work with the patients that had these horrible deformities after the war and just putting her back into the spotlight. That was her first photo shoot after the hematoma was at the hospital when she was working with patients and it just lit her up again and she got her self-esteem back. So she decided to support them uh, for the rest of her life. And we still support them today with the Ava Gardner Trust She also is a lover of animals. I'm sure her fans are quite aware that she had many pets throughout her life. She loved corgis and she supported an animal hospital in London that unfortunately went out of business during the COVID pandemic, but we have replaced that charity with uh, St. Jude's. She loved children. She did a lot of work with them when she was with us and uh, we chose that for her. I'm sure she would be a big supporter of them as well. And of course we support the Ava Gardner museum because they are helping us to keep her beautiful memory alive. Well, I'm just delighted to see what's being done with the funds from the Ava Gardner trust. Millions of dollars have been given to charities since Ava created the trust in 1986 supporting animal welfare, medical research, and educational outreach. And as you've mentioned, currently the key charities are the Ava Gardner Museum, the Queen Victoria Hospital in London, and St. Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. And Ava, if you're listening and watching, we love you for that. And you've set a wonderful example for all of us to be generous and kind to people and animals who need our help. Now, as I mentioned in my introduction, you're filming this interview from the Ava Gardner Museum in Smithfield, North Carolina, which is dedicated to educating the public about the life and career of Miss Gardner. Tell me about some of your favorite artifacts and exhibits at the museum. Well, Harvey, we're sitting in front of an exhibit here that uh, is a, a little bit new. They changed it up a little bit for the Ava Gardner Festival that was held this year for her 100th birthday celebration. And we have some of the artifacts from our collection. The little dress behind me was a gift from Ava when she was living in Spain to my mother. And there's a little picture of my mom up there with her matching flamenco dress and a little (laughs) set of castanets. Ava's favorite thing to send me when I was little were dolls. And so I have my most prized possession behind me on this side, which you probably can't see, but it is a little porcelain doll in a Spanish clown outfit with the handwritten letter on her stationery that she wrote to me when she sent that gift. But 
I'll let you talk a little bit about what else is in here. <laughs> well, of course, we share articles from our personal collections with the museum, but the museum is a wonderful top-rated small museum in this country. It houses virtually thousands of Ava Gardner artifacts, and the staff here continually rotates these exhibits to keep it fresh and exciting. Uh, they are incorporating some technology into some of the exhibits, which uh, is also really nice. But I guess one of my favorite artifacts is the safari jacket from Magambo. That's here. <laughs> and a cape from the Barefoot Contessa. She did not actually wear that cape uh, in the movie, but publicity shots were taken in that gorgeously embroidered cape. That's here. Many other famous costumes. And then there is Mama Gardner's <laughs> fried chicken plate. You know, Ava was famous for cooking and eating fried chicken because that was a staple in the South. And the plate that Mama Gardner, her mother, served fried chicken on to Mickey Rooney is here in the museum. Well, that alone is a reason to go <laughs> to field, North Carolina to the Ava Gardner Museum. Do you have her recipe for fried chicken? We do, yes. Okay, when I come to visit, will you make it? I yes. certainly will. Oh, I would love that. <laughs> I want to ask you, Ava, you know that your great aunt wrote a memoir entitled Ava, My Story, which was published eight months after she died. What did you think of that book? Well, uh, her business manager was in a hurry to get this uh, on the market, to get that book on the market. And I think that up to the point where she died, that it, it's good, but it kind of drops off. And there was so much more in the autobiographical recordings. Uh, she did about 90 cassette recordings for the ghostwriters in, in order for them to, do, to ghostwrite the book for her. And... I have been able to recover about a third of those, and I have just been amazed at what's there that didn't get into the book because the book was published in such a hurry. And our plans are to do a revised, not a reprint, but a revised edition that incorporates some of this new material. Oh, well, when that comes out, would you come back on our show to promote it? I certainly will. Be delighted oh. to. Now, there have been a number of books written about Ava. If someone wanted to read the definitive biography of Ava Gardner, do you have any books that you would recommend? There are two. Ava, My Story and the companion book, Living with Miss G, written by her longtime friend, and really, I guess her title should be Gal Friday. Mm -hmm. Maureen Jordan was not just her housekeeper, but she was like a sister and was with her for 20 years. And uh, she has written a derivative to Ava My Story, and it is entitled Living with Miss G. It was published in 2012, I believe. And these two books together, I think, are the definitive Ava Gardner, and I would recommend both of them. Now, Ava Gardner would have turned 100 years old this past December, and in honor of her 100th birthday, you've licensed a number of products that you feel authentically represent Ava. Let's start with the Ava Gardner Signature Bourbon Whiskey, which won a gold medal in 2020, correct? <laughs> that is correct. So tell me about that. What made you decide to license her name to a whiskey? That was a complete coincidence and happy accident with our 
best friends and family now, <laughs> the people at the Seven Jars Distillery. Dale Radcliffe founded the Seven Jars Distillery in Charlotte, North Carolina, from a family recipe that he found buried on their property. And we do live in a region of North Carolina where bootlegging was a big deal. There is still family money supporting this part of North Carolina to this day from bootlegging. So Ava Gardner definitely knew all about bootlegging and the people at Seven Jars Distillery know all about it as well. And they thought that Ava Gardner would be a perfect marketing for their bourbon. And we got together with them and made it happen. And it is a fantastic bourbon. Ava loved, loved bourbon when she was around and it's just a match made in heaven. They've been so pleasant to work with and they care so much about Ava's legacy, just as we do. So we have had the absolute pleasure of working with them. And we also have developed a sparkling wine with them very recently. It is a, it's produced by the champagne method. So it tastes very much like champagne, but we just can't call it that because it was not made in France. It was made in California. So uh, we're very proud of those things from Seven Jars. We also have uh, a wine line with them and it is the most beautiful package of wine I've ever seen. <laughs> We've used some of the Burt Pfeiffer paintings to put on those labels and he was a big fan of Ava and he did a lot of portraits of her when he was in his later years. And we love that so much. So for all you bourbon and wine lovers and sparkling wine lovers out there, you can order the Ava Gardner bourbon whiskey and the Ava Gardner wines at sevenjarsdistillery.com. Now let's talk about the Ava Gardner coffee. Tell us about that. Okay. So the Ava Gardner coffee is by a fantastic young lady, Dominique Benedict, and she has a line of coffees that all feature different uh, celebrities from Ava Gardner's era. And even before we got together with her on a bold blend of coffee to match Ava Gardner's bold personality. And it's really been a hit so far. I'm so proud that we have established this partnership with Dominique. She runs a business that is basically women inclusive. So Dominique gets her beans from a woman owned business as well. So it all kind of goes hand in hand. Ava Gardner was a pioneer in her time, in my opinion. And I think she would be very proud that a completely woman owned business is representing her now. Well, I must tell you that Dominique from HollywoodBlends.com sent me a package of Ava Gardner coffee it's absolutely fabulous. I just <laughs> love it. I highly yeah. recommend it. So everybody, you can get the Ava Gardner Goddess Blend Coffee at HollywoodBlends.com. Now, Ava and Ava Melissa, one of the most exciting products is the launch of the Ava Gardner Perfume, which is a fragrance that was created in Paris, especially for her back in the 1950s called Lastre, which means incendiary star. Tell me about that. That was a beautiful pronunciation, by the way. <laughs> We're trying to learn how to pronounce that. <laughs> Lastre. 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 <laughs> so tell me about the perfume. Well, Ava was the spokeswoman for La Galeon and the iconic classic Sortilage perfume back in 1957. And the current owners of La Galeon have brought her back to represent this new fragrance. It is a very modern blend that I think is just perfectly suited for the times and also one that Ava would wear. Well, ladies, if you want to give off that mystical and glamorous exclusive scent that Ava Gardner was known for, you can do it by getting the perfume called Lastre 
created by the famous French perfume house Le Galion. It's available at Neiman Marcus and on the Le Galion website. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Ava Gardner by going to her official website, avagardner.com. And please check out the website for the Ava Gardner Museum, which is at johnstoncountync.org backslash Ava hyphen Gardner. If you Google Ava Gardner Museum, you'll find it. And you can order the Ava Gardner Goddess Blend of Coffee at hollywoodblends.com. You won't be sorry, believe me. The Ava Gardner Select Bourbon Whiskey and the Ava Gardner Signature Wine Collection are available at sevenjarsdistillery.com. And don't forget to look for the Ava Gardner French Perfume, L'Astre, produced by Le Gallion in Paris, available on their website and at Neiman Marcus. Well, Ava and Ava Melissa, I've really enjoyed meeting you and talking about the wonderful Ava Gardner. Thank you so much for everything you're doing to honor and preserve her legacy and to give new generations of movie fans a more complete picture of who she really was. And thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. Thank you, Harvey. It has been a great time. <laughs> yes, thank you. It was our pleasure. We always love to talk about Ava and promote her memory. Well, I can't wait to come down there, meet you in person, have some fried chicken, and visit the museum. Yes. We will also have a little tipple of the award-winning Ava Gardner bourbon. Mm -hmm. I was kind of hoping you'd offer me a little tip. <laughs> <laughs> Our guests have been Ava Thompson, the great niece of cinematic legend Ava Gardner, and her daughter, Ava Melissa. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver, my wonderful managers, Rick and Robin at the Marcelli Company in Hollywood, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.